Hey guys, I would like to introduce you to a Victor Graphic. Now this machine is a 5032 or maybe 5032E model, I'm kind of hearing on the difference. Uh, it was introduced early 80s, probably 84, uh, 85. It is an S100 bus machine powered by a Z80 CPU. It's relatively unknown. Uh, these days at least, the vector graphic machines, which is unfortunate because they really were groundbreaking, fascinating machines, particularly this series, the 5000 series, which is a multi-user system or a mainframe. The earlier machines were single-use only, but were well designed, uh, to say the least. The company itself is very interesting. Vector graphic was started by... I hate to term, use the term uh, in case it sounds... Uh, derisive, derogatory, but it was started by a pair of housewives, um, Lore Harp and Carol Eli. Uh, Lore Harp's husband was a computer guy and was building East 100 boards in his basement at the time, and apparently these two housewives decided they want to do something for a bit of extra time, some extra money, and they started Victor Graphic. The company was began in, I think, 76, and it ran through right until 1986 when it finally went under. Carol and Lore, I believe, both left uh, prior to this, however, due to disagreements with the board, directors, so on and so forth. The usual, you know, computer story, we've all heard it before. These machines are, as I said, S100. The components, however, that builds them, particularly the later machines, are very interesting because they can be almost dropped into any S100 machine. The graphics boards in these, uh, the flash riders, for example, could be a standalone graphics and input card for any S100 machine. You could buy them all separately. You could build your own vector. Um, it was quite clever, in my opinion. Uh, in this case, this machine here, the 5000 series, has a, um, as I said, multi-user system, but it also includes in the lower case here a hard disk, a 40 megabyte Winchester disk, which was enormous at that time, as you can imagine. Some of the machines had dual floppy, some of them had no floppy machine at all internally, but had an external. In this case, you can see it has a single floppy drive in the CPU chassis. If we go and release the camera, we can have a look at the insides here. Now, it's a bit of a mess, um, well, primarily because it's kind of in development. Let me grab my little thing which you get here, which I saved on, I'll talk about that later. When I got this machine, it had been um, rather roughly deinstalled. The cables would run out the back here through this channel and then run to printers, whatever, uh, and the hard disk from the drive controller here. Unfortunately, the people that deinstalled it just simply cut the cables. Not exactly helpful and uh, given how shocking that cut is probably with a pair of cheap scissors. Anyways, um, so we have things like this that are left over but general machine we have nice big linear power supply with some terrifying caps, a Tandon drive, some of the early ones used uh, Micropolis, the Tandons and the Micropolis were uh, hard sectored 100 track per inch instead of 96 track per inch, which is the standard. Makes it a little difficult to get diskettes for these still, uh, particularly the hard sector thing. But they're out there, they can be done. You can also punch your own hard sector disks. Uh, the difference between soft sector and hard sector disks, for those who are unfamiliar with this terminology since it's well out of date by now, is a um, index hole, effectively. Uh, you see this little circle here, I'm sure you've all seen it, you might not have paid attention to it. And in this case, I've actually lined the index hole up so you can see the actual hole through the uh, magnetic media here. On most disks like this, this is a soft sector disk, there is one index hole. This is used to um, derive, derive the indexing for the entire disk. You use this to clock the data coming off the disk so you know how fast it's rotating, where the sectors begin, things like that. In hard sector disks, instead of having just one, there are, in specific locations, holes all in the media. So uh, the first one there's a slightly larger gap and then they're consistent thereafter so you can start the synchronization, the clocking based on each time the index hole comes around. There's a optical reader in there, or a 
optical detector in there that can see the light coming through the hole. Back to the machine. This was a 18 slot S100 back plane. You can see it down there. Uh, the ones that were built into the terminals had uh, six sock back planes, but all of the large ones in these big chassis like this have 18 slots. In my machine, we have this card here, which is the Bitstreamer 2. The Bitstreamer uh, provides three serial ports, two parallel ports, which uh, come off this daughter board here, dip switches for the serials. These are the serial ports here. They actually have uh, cables that plug into these and then run to the back. The Bitstreamer also has a 55 hertz real-time clock on it and this is integral for the multi-user system because it requires this clock to provide the timing source to know when to time slice across the different um, running instances. Next we have the FDHD controller which is floppy disk, hard drive. Uh, you can see we've got our floppy drive cable hooked up here. This was capable of talking to MFM disks, so we have both a data and a control. So I think it's the other way around, control and data. Uh, connections to the hard disk. Next we have the ZCB, which is this one here. The ZCB is kind of nifty. It's the uh, Z80 processor board itself, but it also includes three parallel ports, one serial port, PROM, uh, the system monitor itself, and uh, 1K of static RAM, which um, was enough to bring up a system, although uh, obviously without a real OS, um, 1K just simply wouldn't be enough. However, if you'd use these in, I suppose, an embedded system or something like that, or you know, a controller, system controller, this would be more than enough. You could load whatever you needed in the ROM, 1K of static RAM would be enough to bring the system up. These are 64K RAM boards. And then we have flash riders. There are an odd number of RAM boards to flash riders, which is where we think this might be an E model, which is an extended model. They had a single board that for some reason banked at the same time as the uh, first board in the system, and apparently had like a partial CPM system. I'm not positive, I don't even understand how that works, so don't quote me, but it did come with one extra board. The RAM boards are paired with a flash rider. You can see these lines here. One line, go to the first flash rider, this one to the second, that one to the third. And what it means is that when the RAM board is enabled, the flash rider is enabled. When the system is functioning, each of these boards carries a single standalone install of CPM. CPM was a single user operating system. MPM was the later multi-user operating system, although I don't think that MPM was reported to this. But So each machine, or each board would have its own standalone CPM, and as the system would run, it would time slice requests or uh, operating instructions from each of these RAM boards through this one, the ZCB. This is what makes it a mainframe. Multiple users, multiple terminals using the same resources, the same system. These machines also had a fantastic um, networking called a LinkNet, which allowed you to connect up to, I believe the theoretical maximum was 256 vectors, and you could share, uh, towards the end of the business life this is, um, you could share, uh, obviously printers, you could share hard disks, drives, partitions, things like that, so you could read files on this floppy disk on a machine 200 machines away. I think that's magic. With the advent of the PC, and it's somewhat simpler, but um, certainly more widespread design, things like this disappeared, they sank, and it wasn't until Ethernet for PC came out later that it really became as ubiquitous as it is today.